Hey, hello everyone. I'm Hyde Coulter. Thanks for uh, joining us here. Uh, I'm with Simon Jones today of HelpingRhinos.org. Simon, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Hey, thank you very much for having me on to your, uh, your, your first Hanging with Hake. Well, thank you very much. Um, just a little bit of a backstory. So you're with a, a, a rhino conservancy and uh, as many people know, but maybe not all, uh, the mascot of Threat Quotient is a rhino, as you can see on my lapel pin and the pictures behind me. And uh, a few years ago, we made a commitment to um, support uh, rhino uh, conservation. Certainly, you want your corporate mascot not to become uh, extinct. Now, Simon LinkedIn tells me that you spent 24 years at American Express in the corporate world. How does a guy who does sort of the office gig make a transition to devoting their life to conservation? Um, yeah, that that's right. Hey, that was it's quite true. I was was twenty four years um, at American Express and um, a, a number of years trying to work out how to make that transition from corporate to conservation. And I guess it took a you know you have a multi year plan and uh, you know it, I guess the conservation side has always been been my passion, particularly the rhinos. Uh, and and I'd started you know was doing a little bit of conservation work. I, I guess as a you know. A, as a, as a vol on a voluntary basis in different places, uh, and what really happened was that, that kicked it off was in 2012. There was a, a poaching incident at a, a game reserve in South Africa, the Kareka Game Reserve, which is where I'd spent six weeks on a conservation project in 2010, um, and and that was really the the final push that made me think, you know, e enough wanting to do something and talking about maybe doing something and, and actually let's do something. Uh, so that was the, that's the short version of a, of a very long story as to how that transition happened. Um, so that was in March 2012. And that was really, you know, when Helping Rhinos was, was born. Uh, in fact, we just had our ninth birthday. So we're into our 10th year now. And, um, and yeah, and I'm sure we're going to go on and talk about the progress and yeah. how Helping Rhinos has is, is progressed since that sort of first day yeah, after so that, that like, transition. Yeah, and I take it you're based in the UK, but um, where is this work being done? Yeah, so, so we're based in the UK. Well, our headquarters are here in the UK. We actually have registered offices in the US as well. Um, and and although we haven't made the public announcement, so I guess I'm kind of doing that now, but we, we also have a, an officially registered office in the Netherlands now as okay. well. So, so we, we, we've become a sort of a truly international organization in terms of what we do. And I guess that's the, the point to try and highlight. You know, we, we are here as an international NGO to, and, and our role as, as with any international NGO is essentially providing the funding and rate or raising the funds that we need in order to continue our work on the ground um, so so that's the work that, that I do on a day-to-day -day basis as well as then liaising with our, our guys on the ground and we've got a number of different projects um, that we have predominantly across South Africa and Kenya so we're focusing um, for now on the African species of, of rhino uh, and we have projects like um, so we have a rhino orphanage um, that we work with uh, in KwaZulu-Natal which is on the east coast of South Africa uh, we also work with uh, the Black Mambas which is the you I think you've heard of before the first all-female anti-poaching unit um, that was formed that's up in the, the Kruger National Park area area known as the Greater Kruger Park. Um, we also then um, doing some work um, sort of more widely, I suppose, looking at what we're calling uh, rhino strongholds, which is looking at a, a sort of a very holistic approach to rhino conservation. Um, so know. actually, that's, you bring up an interesting point and a question that I had. So uh, I've certainly heard of the Kruger National Park, but I, I don't know what the difference is between protecting an animal in a park versus um, a stronghold. So can you maybe go into a little bit of detail as to the difference between having animals in a, in a protected park versus whatever the definition is of a, of a stronghold by comparison? Yeah, sure. So, so a, a national park is a government owned park that's there to protect its wildlife um, and, and protect it as a wild space, if you like. So um, if you look at where wildlife, you know, is still lives today, um, you know, a percentage of that wildlife is in national parks, um, but there's also a, a large percentage in privately owned either reserves or conservancies as well. 
Um, now, there's what we term as a rhino stronghold is really looking at an area, and it could be a national park or it could be um, a privately owned reserve or conservancy. Um, and the difference between the two is really just different names in different parts of the <laughs> the, the world, um, but essentially the same sort of thing. Um, so, so what we're looking at as a stronghold is looking at you know at a holistic level, you know how safe is the rhino from a security perspective. You know, we, I'm sure many viewers will understand that rhinos have been poached, you know, over the last 10 to 12 years at a, at a rate that's, you know, threatening them with, you know, the very real threat of extinction, um, you know, in, in our lifetime. So, so it's looking at what's the security, but, but there are other threats to rhinos over and above the, the poaching threat and the security threat, like loss of habitat. You know, we hear all the time in the news about climate change and, you know, the po human population growth um, in 50% of the forecasted population growth, according to uh, uh, an I, uh, United Nations uh, survey, is due to happen in Africa by 2100. So how do we manage that human population growth with the needs of wildlife and the needs to create wild spaces and what that does for, for climate change and biodiversity and ecosystems? So we're looking at that, but we also have to look at the local people that live around these wild spaces. Um, and how do we ensure that the local people are benefiting from wildlife being there? So it, it's about not having wild spaces that's either for the benefit of humans or the benefit of wildlife. How do we how do we find a way to ensure that, that both are able to benefit equally from this space? So that's what we mean by a rhino stronghold. Um, you know, to, to put that into context and you know a little bit easier to understand so you know one rhino stronghold that's kind of been created if you like um for, for a, a number of years now is this greater kruger national park mm -hmm. so you have the kruger national park which is uh, you know the government run by the south african government and then on the western border are a number of private reserves um, and what's been happening there over the last few years is that we've been dropping fences between these private reserves between themselves and also between the national park itself. So you're opening up that this greater Kruger area that allows a natural migratory uh, pattern um, of behavior from from rhinos and and all the other wildlife, whether it's elephants, lions and 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 everything small in between. Um, so that's that's kind of a good example of what we're trying to now create in terms of other rhino strongholds. So it's looking at these areas. How do we combine existing wildlife areas, you know, by dropping fences and, and allowing that more natural migratory behavior or just even natural behavior? Um, you know, you, what we see today is a lot of human hands-on management. So if you've got relatively small, and, you know, when I say relatively small, you know, it, it can take you uh, half a day to drive around some of these areas. So, you know, we're not talking about you know, safari park type small, but we're talking around areas where, you know, you, you would typically have, you know, as a, as an example, if a, if a male rhino is getting older, you know, and is being threatened by an incoming male, that older rhino would move on and find a new territory, the new male will come in. Well, as it stands today, we have to manage that but, you know, with human inter intervention because the, there's too many fences in place. So we have to bring in a new rhino, take out the old rhino and manage that ourselves. So it's how do we allow that more natural behavior by dropping those fences, combining areas? And that's what we're focusing on um, really within certain areas within South Africa that we're working and also our partner in Kenya, um, which is our Pejeta Conservancy um, as well so so it's looking at that that bigger picture as well as continue to focus on everything that we've been doing for the last nine years and and building on those achievements um and and, and those strengths that we have in place so you're you're helping fund um both the parks the conservancy areas and then the people who are supporting that protection you you touch very briefly on the black mambas and i'd like to just go back to that for just a second so uh, I know the black mamba is a um, highly venomous snake, and you mentioned very briefly that uh, this is a um, a group of uh, all female volunteers. Can you just go maybe into a little bit more detail about who they are exactly, how they got started, and and where they're working? Yeah, sure. So, so the black mambas are working in that on, on in the Greater Kruger National Park that I just spoke around on a particularly on one of the reserves there called the Balule um, Nature Reserve. Um, they're, they're just they're, they're not volunteers. They're um, so they are paid okay. employees. So, 
you know, so what, what we looked at with the, the founder of the Black Members, a gentleman called Craig Spencer, was, you know, how can we come up with an innovative, something innovative and something different to try and conquer the, the poaching threat that we had, you know, so, so, and to give you an idea, when, you know, when we were looking at sort of Black Members formed around the same time as Helping Rhinos did, and that was 2012, and you look at 2014, and we lost in South Africa alone over 1,200 rhinos to poachers that year. Um, so, you know, to put again into context, that that's one every five to seven hours. Um, every five to seven hours, every day, on average, we were losing a rhino at the hands of poaching. Uh, so, so the, Craig came up with this idea, which is actually let's use one of the most underused resources within the country, which is the local women. And, and find some women who are, actually have that passion, you know, and, and we've seen that they have a real passion for, for nature, for, for wildlife conservation. And we trained them on two different levels. One was how, how do they be, how, how can they become anti-poaching rangers, you know, in, in a, particularly back then, what was a, you know, almost like a, a war environment in terms of how, you know, in terms of military based, um, but also, they've also got to operate in a big five game reserve. So it's not just around how do you operate and how do you recognize signs of insurgents that's come through the fence from potential poachers, but it's how do you go and walk up? So they walk every day, 20 kilometers up and down a fence line, right. checking for signs of insurgents, um, either animals getting out or more importantly, poachers coming in. Um, so they do that in the 40 degree heat in, in you know, the African sun. But and round the corner at any any one time, of course, therefore could be uh, an, a lion, an elephant, a rhino. Um, so they need to understand how do you walk safely within a big five game reserve. So we took them through all of that that training, um, and it's been phenomenally successful. So even today that they have, you know, we have a, re a reduction in poaching of around sixty three percent within their it's massively area impactful operation, and 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 they're really engaged and passionate. And and then a big piece of what the black members do is that they you know, they, they take the message back out to the community. So they're, they're unarmed. So they're not, there's a bit, you know, there has been a misconception that the Black Members is a, the anti-poaching unit, and, and they're not. They're a cog in the wheel of, a, of the wider anti-poaching unit. So they're a, a frontline presence. They are, um, you know, that link between the community. And I, I don't know how this translates to the, to the US, but in the UK, we used to have what we call the Bobby on the Beat, which was the, the policeman who was patrol on foot and just managing relationships, build relationships with the local communities. And that's kind of what the job of the Black Members is. And they, they now have a, what they call the Bush Babies Program, which is an education outreach where we go and teach conservation into the local schools and you know and we actually bring kids every year into the reserve to see you know although they these kids live on the borders of these wild places that many of them have never seen a rhino or an elephant or, or a lion so we bring them in and we engage them and we help them understand why poaching is bad not just for the animal itself but for you know for for the overall ecosystem um and I think where you were coming as well with the snakes is probably why they're called the Black Members. Yeah. So I, we actually let the ladies themselves look at that and, and they, were, they decided they were, the Black Members was appropriate because, as you say, it's a, it's a fearsome snake that you, know, you don't want to come into contact with and you certainly don't want to get bitten by it because you, you won't survive very long. So they, they wanted to, a name that sort of portrayed the, their sort of their origins of coming from the local communities, but also, you know, we're somebody you need to fear. So that was how the, the Black Mambas name came about. Excellent. And roughly how many um, Black Mambas are there? So there's 36 women um, today, and they are split between different sites um, on patrol. And, and some of them are, as I said, are on the, the education outreach program as well. So, uh, and you said, uh, I think a 63% reduction in poaching with their presence. So hugely impactful. Um, so those are sort of uh, feet on the ground, but um, tell me a little bit about eyes in the sky, which is another uh, vector, I think, in, in protecting the rhinos. Yeah, so there's, the, you know, so, so you're right, you've got boots on the ground, which is the, the, the black members, but then, you know, increasingly using technology. So, um, so in a different part of South Africa, in the Eastern Cape, we work um, with uh, one of our, our vets, uh, William Folds, and his um, African Rhino Conservation Collaboration, or, or ARC, for, for less of a mouthful um, program, <laughs> and, and the, the Kareka Foundation as well down there. So we work with them on, on a numerous different 
different elements and and eyes in the sky is something that um, I know Threat Quotian have helped us continue to fund over over recent times as well in uh, and basically what that is is we, it's proven that if you have an aerial presence it's a deterrent to for poachers coming into that area so so we have a, a pilot um, who um, a called uh, Siseko, Siseko Meenji, and he, is, he comes from the, the local community and he, he has an incredible story that I think sums up what we're trying to do with conservation and what we need to do with conservation. So, you know, he was passionate. He grew up in, in one of the local villages. He, he was passionate about wildlife. He managed to, to persuade Will to take him on, on as a sort of to assist him and, you know, looking for some, some you know, on some of the vet work, whether it's spotting animals or, or holding different bits of equipment. And, and one day he, he got up in a helicopter as they were going looking for, for uh, I think it was a rhino that needed some treatment. Uh, and, and that was his other big passion, came out there, was flying. So he actually put himself through getting some scholarships and put himself through, and he actually qualified as a commercial pilot. Uh, so now to build up his flying hours, he's running the, the Eyes in the Skies anti-poaching program uh, in, the, in the Eastern Cape. And, you know, we're looking at that and we're looking at how do we find the next Siseko. So it becomes a bit of a, you know, chain. And, and again, so we're giving back to the local communities. We're giving them opportunities um, for employment opportunities in, in an area which is one of the highest unemployment rates in South Africa. Uh, and and so so that re that's the community element. But then from an anti-poaching perspective, as I said, it's proven that um, uh, that, that having a presence in the sky is is um, is, is a good deterrent, and and even that, you know, you, it's not a case of we'll put the plane up between two o'clock and three o'clock every day because then the poachers know what time the plane's right. up and know when to avoid. So we have to manage it and you know put it up at different times so everybody's kept on their toes. Interesting. So um, you mentioned a little bit that part of the conservancy is protecting the lands, but then clearly. Uh, poaching where is the demand um coming from and and why rhino horn it, i think for some people it's hard to understand why there is a demand for something that's basically the same material as your fingernails yeah so so that and you're absolutely right that's the first thing to point out rhino horn is made of of keratin it, it is exactly the same substance as this human hair and fingernails um it, it, it's used in Asia, um, it has been for, for many years for in traditional Asian medicine, uh, where it's believed it can cure anything from a cancer to a common cold to a hangover, um, which, if you think about it, is is just ridiculous um, when you think what it is. But you know, we also know um, that you know beliefs can be beliefs can be you know have be very powerful um, in terms of someone really believes it's going to make a difference. Um, so, you know, the, the biggest two countries um, that, that sort of it's smuggled into, because it, it, we should note that it's illegal to, to trade in rhino horn. So, so the biggest two countries that, that, that come into is Vietnam and China. Uh, and, and actually what we've seen is, you know, at the height of the rhino poaching, and I'm going back to 2012, to, no, sorry, 2014 to 2016, when so it's really at its height, is that, you know, this this... This thing here was selling at about sixty-five thousand to a hundred thousand dollars per kilogram on the black market, wow. which made it more expensive per kilogram than gold and platinum and heroin, cocaine. Um, you know, and and then what that what that then drove was uh, uh, a, a, almost an additional market, which was um, almost a status symbol. So. Uh, you know, people were in buying it, and this was this was more perhaps in Vietnam than, than China. We were seeing this that uh, you know people were using and having rhino horn as a status symbol. So if you were to prove you were a successful businessman, you might offer a potential client some rhino horn in your glass of wine, or you'd have a rhino horn positioned, you know, in on the in the you know in the back of the office. So just so people can see, the analogy I always use is, um, you know, if people are you know perhaps in the Western world. And you've got a successful businessman he might offer you a lift in his ferrari not because he wants to give you a lift in his ferrari he just wants you to know he's got a ferrari and right. he's that successful and it was the same principle so so we've seen that you know the, the good news is that the, the, the value of horn has come down um and it's now selling on the black market for around 20 to twenty five thousand dollars per kilogram 
uh, which is still a lot of money for something that's that's nothing more than our hair and our fingernails, uh, and and still too high, you know. And we and we do still see poaching, and you know we're still losing on average at, at least one rhino a day, um, and, which is and still a shocking number. It, and that's even after you know because of COVID, you know, says South Africa, and you know I talk about South Africa a lot because seventy two percent of the world's rhinos are found in South Africa. Um, so, so you know, with that, with anim, that which is why we quote South African numbers. That they're the main numbers that, that get quoted. But, uh, but you know, so South Africa has a you know had a particularly you know a new variant. So you know they were locked down for most of last year. So which meant the borders were closed. You couldn't get rhino horn out. Um, even despite that, we still lost two hundred and ninety four rhinos last year to poaching. So um, interesting. So uh, a, a planet that has largely been shut down for the last year still really hasn't changed the demand for the horn. I, I think the demand is slightly reducing. We're definitely seeing that the, um, the, the demand for the status symbol is, is lessening, um, which is a positive, you know, and that has a natural cycle. I think anything where things are a, are a fashion, if you like, you, yeah. you you see that cycle, so that that's encouraging. You know, we, we and we have to cling to that. You know, we we lost a thousand rhinos less last year than we did in two thousand and fourteen, um, but that's still not to say that that it's it's a you know it's still not a sustainable level. There's still a lot of work to be done. So, if the demand is coming from places like China and Vietnam, has there been um, an effort to try to do education? in the places where there is demand to say, yeah. look, this this doesn't do anything and, and you're actually hurting uh, a species and you're you're risking driving them to extinction. Yeah, so there is there are definitely um, education programs within Asia um, to address exactly that, to try and address demand. I think we have to be realistic that, you know, to, certainly in use of Asian medicines, you know, this is, you know, it isn't just rhino horn and, and that that use has been there for thousands of years, you know, um, so we're not necessarily going to change that. Also, from a helping rhinos perspective, you know, so we don't go, so, so, you know, I I go and visit the projects in Africa and talk to the local people there, but but I don't necessarily go to to Asia and start educating because I'm just another Westerner telling, uh, you know, someone from Asia how to live their lives, you know, and they would argue that that that's you know their, their beliefs. They they equally as we tell them it has no medicinal value, they believe it does, you know. So um, so we have to to try and manage it. So what we do is we work with um, partners based in those countries to run those education. So for example, we funded um, a number of students in Vietnam to go through the first official conservation scholarship and university program. Oh. Um, and, and one of the students that we funded has actually gone on to, to secure a role um, with an organization in Vietnam in conservation and, and build their career in conservation. So for me, it's that's the right approach is that we must use the local people to give education because then you get Vietnamese or Chinese people talking to Vietnamese and Chinese people around, you know, around why using rhino horn is not is not the thing to do. So, so the un short answer to your question is yes, that does happen. Yes, we do work and fund some of that through um, through some of our Asian partners. Um, but but our I suppose our our main focus is the protection side of it. So if you think about the two sides, there's prevention, there's protection, there's prevention. Um, and both need to happen. Uh, and certainly I believe that that we must in, in conservation world, you know, not try and believe we can be everything to everyone. You know, right. it's all about people playing to their strengths and where can you have the biggest impact. You know, our biggest impact is, is undoubtedly on the protection side with the contacts and the people that we, we have um, and our projects in across Africa. And then, as I said, on the prevention side in, in Asia, we'll work with the local people and support them where, where, where we can. So you're doing an incredible job supporting people in the air, people on the ground, people in the parks. How can people listening now help you help all of those people? So, so there's there's many different ways. Um, uh, the first thing people will probably expect me to say is donations, and, and <laughs> I will and I will come to that. <laughs> but um, but actually, you know, I, let me start with something that that, that isn't maybe quite so obvious, um, which is actually just following Helping Rhinos on social media. 
Um, okay. For example, we post a lot of things every day, you know, information around what's going on in the world of rhino. So, you know, part of the biggest problem is is getting the word out there so people really understand um, what's the challenge. So, so follow us. We're it's very simple. We're at Helping Rhinos on every single social media platform. So follow us on there. Um, visit the website, which is helpingrhinos.org. Um, I think it's up on the screen at the moment. So, so visit the website as well. There you can make donations. As I, as I mentioned before. You know, for, for all of for all of the, the great work that we're doing with our projects on the ground, none of that can happen if we can't provide the funding to make it happen. You know, whether it's putting up fences around, you know, to to reduce wildlife, human wildlife conflict, um, whether it's putting fe pulling fences down to open up areas, just to pick two examples around fences, that all takes funding. Right. Um, you know, whether it's we're actually in the process at the minute of of building a, a, a school um, on the borders of one of our reserves so that kids can get a much better start to their education. That takes a lot of money. We're fortunate to have a sponsor who, who's helping us with that. So so they're the key things, really. You know, there's, there's stuff that we can do at home. It's understanding. It's engaging with organizations like us, you know, like Helping Rhinos, um, and, and helping us to do what we do. Um, and I guess that's from a threat quotient perspective, Haig, is, is why I'm so appreciative of our partnership, because you really are helping us on both those levels. You know, I know you're out talking about rhinos and helping rhinos at the various events that you have, which is phenomenal. And you're also, you know, you, you've, you've made some donations through, through some of those in the past as well. So they're, they're kind of the key ways, I guess, that people can can help you know once you get onto the website you'll find things like our a new sustainable range of clothing for example so it's all organic cotton it's what we call um circular fashion so in other words you buy a t-shirt that says helping rhinos or has a rhino image on it so you're helping to spread awareness the profits of that comes into helping rhinos and then from an environmental perspective when you're bored of it or finished with it you send it back to where you bought it from and then they recycle it and make a new t-shirt out of it wow. so from an, so it, it's a win-win in all in all levels so uh, i think all you know all those there's many different things and, and the website is the best place to find okay wonderful and i will say that uh Certainly when we do um, trade shows and events, every time we scan a badge, we um, make a dollar donation uh, to Helping Rhinos. And I do want to say that, uh, Simon, we very much appreciate your time today. And uh, as Threat Quotient's way of saying thank you, we're making a donation today to Helping Rhinos um, as well. Now, I love sort of wrapping things up on more of a high note. And people who know me will say that, you know, I'm, kind of a person who has uh, a lot of random facts bouncing around uh, in his brain. And I will sort of say rando things all the time, but I would love to hear something interesting about rhinos. I, I would say that they're certainly one of the most recognizable animals, which is why obviously we have them as a, as a company mascot, but they're such big animals. Do they make a sound like, <laughs> Tell us something interesting about rhinos that maybe people listening here wouldn't know. Okay, I, I, let me do this, but, but let me just go back, hey, if I can, and just say thank you for your it is for our your pleasure. donation. Um, I really appreciate it. So, so thank you very much um, for that. Um, in terms of interesting facts, variants, well, there's so many interesting facts, and and we did talk about this before, and and they do rhinos do make an interesting noise. So, I actually have a little clip here um, because I thought you might ask me this around. <laughs> How can I, what is the noise that uh, a rhino makes? So, so let me just play this little clip. Hopefully the sound will come out and, you, and you'll hear this. Uh, let's, just, let's just see if that works. I think we just have to let the, uh, the team in the back go. There you go. Um, right, so if I just play this, you'll hear the noise. Fascinating. So, so it's very sure. Let me just just play 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 it again. If it'll go, so you hear that again. And these look like very uh, like young or juvenile rhinos. Does the pitch change as they get bigger, or does it always stay that high? The uh, yeah. So so adults will make pretty much exactly the same sound. So you know you get a big two and a half ton rhino, and it can make exactly <laughs> that same that same sort of squeaking noise that I call it. You're right, these are young ones. These are our orphanage facilities. So they're there because they're um, 
Their mums were poached, so they were rescued and are being cared for by our, our carers there. Um, one of whom you can just see there. Yes. And they're looking for food, obviously. So up to a certain age, we still have to feed them. Um, but yeah, so the adults still make that that noise in certain certain situations. They also um, the adults also will make a sort of a grunting and a snorting noise. I have to say, I have I have been out on foot once tracking black rhinos, which are much more. Um, or less docile, shall we say, okay. more aggressive than the white rhino. These were white rhinos you see here. Actually, from my shoulder is a, is a black rhino. But um, so I've been out and, and you hear the snorting and then the thundering of feet. And, and that's when you start to panic a little bit. <laughs> um, so they make all sorts of different noises. But it is quite, quite strange to hear or see and hear a two and a half ton, second biggest land mammal on planet making that sort of squeaky, squeaky noise. Yeah, especially when you think uh, how much noise an elephant makes, you'd think that there'd be a similar sound coming from the second biggest land mammal. Yeah, exactly. So so that there's an interesting fact. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, listen, uh, Simon. Thank you. This has been fascinating. Um, please go to helpingrhinos.org. And um, we look forward to seeing you guys in the future. And thanks for hanging with us. Until next time, we'll see you later.